my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. In last week's weekly email uh, that comes from our office to all of you, I posed the question, how do you know that you are following God's commands? It's a tough one to answer. How do we know? And the readings uh, that we have this week tend to raise our anxiety and leave us wondering if we are on the right path. The reading from Deuteronomy is Moses speaking on behalf of God and giving the people a choice. Follow God's commandments and you will have a long and prosperous life. Choose to disobey God's commandments and life is not going to be so great. We have blessings and curses, life and death. Easy choice, right? I mean, who wouldn't choose life and blessing? Then in the Gospel, we have part of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew. Jesus is teaching in this very formulaic style. He says, you have heard it said, but then I say to you. And in that, with each but that Jesus utters, the stakes get higher and higher and higher. It's not just about committing murder anymore. It's about having any bad thoughts in your heart against someone else. Everything Jesus says in this gospel reading takes the basics of, you know, outline of the law and colors in the details of what it means. In verse 20 of this chapter of Matthew, which is right before our um, gospel reading begins, Jesus tells the people that their righteousness must exceed that of the religious authorities of their day, or they will not enter the kingdom of God. The thing that's interesting to me about these readings is that they show up in the middle of the season of Epiphany. Now, it, the season of Epiphany is not a time of penitence like Lent is, which we're going to begin in just a few weeks. Epiphany is a season of light and revelation, of discovery and aha. Epiphany is a season when the grace and love of God is made manifest in the person of Jesus. So, when I consider the season and then the readings with all their dire consequences and warnings, I find myself at a loss. How are these readings epiphany readings? What do we make of them? I think part of the problem in reconciling these two different perspectives is our point of view. If you think of point of view in terms of film, there is a choice made about what angle, from what angle a scene is viewed. Could be an overhead shot or a close-up. Maybe it focuses on the person who's speaking or on the person who's listening. The points of view are, uh, points of view possible are many and varied. In the Gospel reading, the immediate point of view I imagine is that of God, an overhead shot, if you will. Looking down on all of us, seeing what we're up to, keeping a tally, making judgments. But that point of view eliminates love and grace. There's no love and grace in making judgments and keeping a tally. And we know that love and grace is always how God relates to us. So what other point of view might be possible if we consider being viewed through the lens of God's love and grace? How about a point of view that looks from the inside out? In everything that Jesus says, he is talking about what is happening in our hearts. It's not about our actions, and that's part of it. But he's talking about our hearts. What we do begins with what happens in our hearts. And by heart, I mean the biblical understanding of heart. Not just the center of feeling, but 
heart as our mind and soul and spirit, our reason and our will and our desires. All those things that make us human. All these commands that Jesus makes with their dire consequences are about what's going on inside of us. The point of view Jesus is showing us is the point of view of the heart. Now from this point of view, the consequences of our choices and actions become less about some kind of divine punishing justice and more about a statement of fact. I mean, think about this for a minute. If one's heart is the kind of heart that harbors hateful thoughts, then that one is already living in that hell that Jesus describes, right? If that's the condition of your heart, then you are already in that hell. If one has a clean heart, a heart that is focused on God and love and grace, and a heart that is humble, a heart that recognizes that even though this is our focus, we're still going to fall short because we're human, then that one has already entered the kingdom of God. It's really simple. It's a matter of choice. Make a choice for God, for love, for grace. Put your energy there. I said last week, and I want to say it again, this is not some place that we arrive at and then life begins. Rather, this is something that we choose to begin in every moment of every day. We make a choice to choose God. We make a choice to align our hearts with God's heart. And when we make that choice, when we choose to begin this, then we experience this light and revelation of the season of epiphany. That's when things start to make sense. There is a wonderful prayer by Thomas Merton which I suspect many of you are familiar with. It sums all this up in a most beautiful, humble, and simple way. And I want to close with that prayer. But first, let me say that when you find yourself wondering if what you are doing is in keeping with God's commandments, ask yourself what it is that your heart desires. And then trust that when your heart's desire is for God, God will take care of the rest. Let us pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen.